what's going on guys, it's me Train Man, and welcome back to the Zombie Train episode 178, yeah, 178. This week we're working on the old main, and uh, a place called Andy's Hideaway, which uh, the relevance of it will be explained shortly, this is kind of a bit of a spoiler perhaps showing where it is, but eh, a little bit. If you if you don't want to if you don't want to take a look don't take a look I do try to avoid spoilers in my construction, but uh, you know construction's construction you got to get it done. Anyways, this week's question is by East Rail. It was posted on episode 175, otherwise called uh, 3254, where I talked about that engine in particular. He asked, "Dose the zombie train use 411, 844." and 4449, or any other SP engines. Uh, and Big Boys and Challenges by UP. That was in a second comment, but anyways. Uh, I digress. I answered the other question in that comment, and I have talked about some of those engines in the past, especially uh, 4449 and its relevance to the Battle of Portland, uh, and how we kind of ran it ragged and may have slightly damaged it. Uh, maybe more than slightly, I'm sorry. SP fans. It came back into service, don't worry. Uh, but, in in short, I would like to title this episode The Big Engines, and that's really more or less what this is about. Because there are quite a few of these really hefty, good-sized engines that we ended up using, and that we really needed uh, as well. Now, I'm going to bring open the, the locomotive roster here for the Zombie Train Incorporated and, and read some stuff off and tell you uh, what these things were used for. Now, keep in mind, of course, the, the most populous uh, locomotives in terms of survivors were <laughs> O4Os. And as I'm sure you understand, those are very useful in small scale, but not so useful when you're trying to haul massive amounts of uh, resources cross-country uh, through zombie-infested wasteland. You're not going to get very far. You know, Oswald and Carolyn, if you've read the past, you'll know, I uh, did quite a bit in their 040, Hank, and they made uh, you know they made quite an impact rolling on their own until a certain unfortunate thing stopped them. Right behind that is two eight O's, and there are actually 150 two eight O's uh, left in the United States as it stands. That's something we didn't need to build a lot more of, uh, and we didn't do a lot of engine building. We didn't do a lot of building. Period, as you guys uh, know, and as I've talked about before. And then 06 O's, then Mikados, there are 83 Mikados, 75 Prairies, and I didn't really have use for the Prairies or the 10 Wheelers, uh, 55 Pacifics, and Pacifics were exceptionally useful, especially out on the plains, uh, because they were some of the fastest things that we had aside from the Northerns, and they didn't necessarily waste a lot of weight on the, uh, on the frivolous bits. You know, extra. You know, they they had if they had a decent sized firebox, they could they could roll for ages. And we had uh, there were very few Hudsons left, but we were able to make some decent Hudsons out of I think the uh, the the Santa Fe Hudson that's still around is kind of the king of Hudsons. I'm not sure if that thing could have beaten the uh, the other you know the Canadian Hudson at locomotive versus, but that's something we didn't get to try. Anyways. We can talk for a moment about the real big engines. Now, the Pacifics, they were good across the plains, etc., but, you know, they began to falter when you made it into the mountains. The, uh, the smaller engines, as I've mentioned, didn't do a hell of a lot. The Consolidations and the Prairies and the Ten-Wheelers, they did their work. The Ten-Wheelers mostly around in suburban areas or areas where you didn't need to haul a lot or go very fast or go a massive distance. Uh, we There are a couple of Atlantics still around that we did use for sort of crack express trains when we needed them, because despite the fact that they weren't the best at adhesion and climbing hills, they could run. There are 21 Berkshires and 40 Northerns still around in the United States, and uh, that could that could have been taken, and that were taken at the time of the zombie train, incorporated. The Northerns were very much workhorses. They didn't go as fast as our premier locomotive, that armored T1, but that was something we built after the fact, very, very specialized, and 
they could do just about anything you told them to do. Now, the problem is they were rail breakers, and so were the eight big boys, and how many how many challengers? There are two challengers left, and there are several other good-sized malays, three 2884s, uh, as well as uh, ten 2662s. Now, those aren't exactly runners, but the big boys and challengers were certainly runners. And they would, again, they were they were rail breakers, so we needed to be careful about where they sent them, but the big boys in the northerns, they did a lot of heavy lifting cross-country for the Zombie Tune Incorporated, and that's really what they were used for. They weren't used for anything less than going uh, practically coast-to-coast, -coast, effectively coast-to-coast. -coast. Whoa, things are screwing up on my computer. Great, fun things. Uh, because... The Iron Horseman, or not Iron Horseman, goddamn, I'm mixing my universes. The Zombie Train Incorporated was based largely on the East Coast, or at least very close to. You know, we had significant facilities in Strasbourg, as well as in Scranton, uh, as well as our facilities in Quants that we built ourselves, and a few areas around there. Now, the reason we had to build a facility in Quants is to serve, um, to serve the northeast to serve New England from a centralized point. We wanted something, and you know, Quonset isn't exactly centralized, but we wanted something in the neighborhood that we were already familiar with, and uh, as, as the Quonsets and the Islanders basically became one after the war, after uh, and after Donatio died of mercury poisoning, uh, which was not purposeful, I might add. It was not an assassination. Uh, he tried to fix a great many things, and sort of drove himself mad. Anyways, the, uh, the, the point there at Quonset provided us an excellent opportunity for expansion. It provided us an airstrip, a deep water port, and, you know, pretty much everything we needed. The, the big engines didn't hardly ever come to Quonset. The Northerns and the Malays, and the uh, Berkshires, well, not quite the Berkshires, uh, mostly uh, the Berkshire, the largest thing you'd see east of the Hudson River, more often than not, aside from the, the special train, would be a Berkshire or a uh, mountain type. And these were, of course, very important on the old B&A, and to use them as such. I just realized I missed two of those spline points over there that I could have used to uh, assist. Anyways. Uh, but more than likely you'd see some Mikados, some consolidations uh, for the for the passenger trains around the area for what we needed to do. Uh, you know, fast goods trains, passengers, uh, mail, uh, you know, medical supplies, anything that really needed to get there. That's uh, We'd have Atlantics around. And, you know, that's what the area was good for. And then the rest of it was managed by prairies, ten-wheelers, moguls. Uh, pretty much whatever we had on hand. Again, the east is not large. It doesn't need a lot of motive power. Out west, we, we brought out the... Uh, to the Rocky Mountains, we brought out all of the heavy lifting. Uh, although to the deep south, they got some as well for the, for the coal mining what of it we did. So we had an even distribution of, you know, challengers, uh, you know, challengers, uh, Malay moguls, that'd be 2662s, uh, big boys, 2882s, the two Alleghenies, I believe there was one down south and one out west, uh, the 2884s. They got used, and they got used to hell. There was, um, we also had the Jubilee on the east coast, uh, but there was a lot of usage of these very, very large engines uh, out west. You know, as, as you go, as you cross the country, you reach, let's say you're going from San Francisco, which was a very, very major base and pretty much the center of the universe for all intents and purposes at that point in time. Going from San Francisco to... Quonset, let's say, as a stopping point. You'd more than likely get on a train, 
you get on a train and you'd head over the Rocky Mountains immediately. Either that or you'd go north or south and head over the Rock the Rocky Mountains. Uh, that the uh, Marias Pass was generally regarded as easy mode, uh, so to speak. It was it was fairly easy compared to a significant number of the other ways to get over the Rockies. And we did use this to our advantage and, and relegated some of the lighter stuff up there. We almost never sent Malays over uh, Marias. But they did get some big engines, particularly Northerns. Anyways, you'd, you'd more than likely get on a train, and you'd head out over the Rocky Mountains. But once you got to the other side, once you got to the edge of Colorado, uh, you know, we... We had the ma major, major exchange point in Denver when we took the city back, which was not an easy task, uh, at, at Burnham Shops, because we could do a lot with locomotives there at Burnham. And so we, we would do, you'd probably do an engine swap there, and you'd get swapped off of your Malay onto something that can go fast, and that'd be either a Hudson or, uh, you know, if you were on a northern, you might keep, you might keep the northern going east, but it would either be a Hudson, it may be an Atlantic if the train was light enough, or it'd more than likely be a Pacific, uh, because we had quite a few Pacifics and we made some pretty damn big ones, and we did make a few Pacifics because to bolster our ranks was nice. Uh, we actually did make as well a few Alleghenies, so we started with one out east and one out west, and each of them, uh, each of the facilities, not Roanoke, but one of. Uh, you know, you'd you'd hope it would be Roanoke, but Roanoke was not uh, prime for the taking. And but we were able to, uh, you know, we were able to manifest facilities out there. I, again, I'm not too acquainted with the South. I don't know where, but we were able to get facilities out there, and they would they would build they built themselves some pretty heavy duty engines, as did the West, uh, based off of. The designs that we said, okay, these are good to replicate. The other ones run into the ground and we'll fix when they break. That was generally the consensus. And so you'd run across country, you'd run across the plains. You might get a stop or two at the clay basins uh, out there in the Mississippi River floodplain area. You know, sort of, uh, you know, near Kansas City or St. Louis. Is Kansas City on the, on the Mississippi? Or, no, I'm thinking of a different river, am I? But out there in the 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 floodplain area of these major rivers where a lot of silt drops. It's very good for clay, and I've talked about that before. You might pick up something there. If you're picking up something uh, heavy, like a clay deposit, you're probably going to be running with the northern. If not, you might run straight through. And you'll get up to probably... Uh, you'll probably get into the edge of the Appalachians, if your train can make it to Scranton, then there will be a, a change out for at least helper power. And you'll go from Scranton to Selkirk, where you'll change out power entirely. Uh, because there were three major divisions, and there was... Well, there were three... No, let's see. There were four major divisions, I should say. There was the South. And the South actually... Uh, the South actually was the East, just not including New England. And, and the reason for that was because we sort of extended the South up past New York and kept it on the west side of the Hudson. And, you know, South and, and is in air quotes. And it was in here that we ran a lot of our heavy Appalachian power. So basically, you could call the South region, air quotes, the Appalachian region. So then you had the New England region, and I've already talked about what's there, and then you had the Plains region, which is everything between the Appalachians and the Rockies. Again, just fast power out there. Nothing really heavy lifting, you know, no decapods, no, um, you know, none of these massive, massive engine types that don't go very fast, but do pull a lot, because out there, once you get out there, you cannot go slowly, or else you will be mobbed. You know, I'm not saying the drag freights go hugely slowly up there, especially when they've got a big boy on the head. But, uh, you know, it is all about speed, and you never want to get bogged down on the planes, because they will find you, the zombies will find you, and they will eat you, and they will come in force. 
Anyways, continuing off of that, the other and final division was the Western Division, and that was the Rocky Mountains and the West Coast, kind of all bundled into one. And of course, these had subdivisions, but you had some of the larger Malays working there, holding stuff over the hills, and these were, of course, heavily guarded trains because they were going slowly, and the area was, uh, you know, sort of... You'd think not being densely populated would be, would be a blessing, but in some cases it was a curse. Anyways, these these big engines there, they definitely saw their heyday. No, uh, Virtually no engine went unused because it would have been a waste of materials. And it would have been a waste of, uh, you know, it would be something that was sitting out. And we don't want that to happen. We never want that to happen. Uh, anyways, keep the questions coming. In a few episodes, we have another route review, so let's... I wonder what's gonna wonder whose route I'm gonna be looking at then. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I will see you next week. Train man out.